Thank you so much for leading us in worship this morning. Um, we are going to take a moment and just, um, I'd like to pray one more time before we jump into our scripture this morning. And so please join me as we pray together. Heavenly Father, um, I'm grateful to be here this morning and just ask that you would open our hearts and minds as we open up your scriptures today. Um, may you speak to us through what we read, through what we hear, and the interaction that we have with one another. God, I am so grateful to be here and to be given this opportunity to speak once again from your word. And so may your Holy Spirit guide and direct as we learn today. Thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as I had mentioned last week, we had... Um, not planned for this if you looked at the church calendar, uh, but uh, Ray was, uh, Pastor Ray was called out to uh, work in Fort Mac as a chaplain with Billy Graham Society. And so um, I just uh, stepping in began to think about options of what we could talk about this week. And this is something that uh, one of the few that uh, God had been laying on my heart over the last uh, little bit. And so I'm going to um, go into this. It's in the middle. It's just kind of a standalone sermon, which I don't often do um, in a, a free Sunday that we have this morning. I do want to mention, if you have any thoughts or ideas of things that you would like to hear about, um, we're in the stages of planning both for the summer and for the next year. And so if there is a particular topic or theme or idea or a passage, um, use that connection card, and on the bottom left, there's actually a little spot where you can write that in. And we have gotten a few different ideas from different people, uh, but we value your input as well uh, during this planning time. This morning, we're going to talk about the story of Jonah. There's a blue sheet in your bulletin. You can pull it out and follow along with uh, the sermon there uh, as well. On that same sheet, you'll find your take-home questions um, for your own personal devotion as well as for small group. Um, as we are turning to that book um, in the Bible, I will give you a little bit of background. Um, I'm going to ask someone, though, to help me find Jonah in those red hymnals in front of you. So this is audience participation, and I want you to tell me the page number that the book of Jonah is on. You'll find it in the Old Testament right after the book of Obadiah. But I want to make sure everyone can follow along with us today. Um, do you have the page number, Caleb? 916. And so that would be in the hard-covered red hymnals in your pews in front of you. Now, do you know what page it's in in my book as well? No, I'm just kidding. So if it should be right around 916-ish in the red, the hard-covered red Bibles in front of you. So Jonah is part of the minor prophets is where we would classify this book as. We're going to talk a little bit about the history, a little bit of a background and understanding so that we can place the book both within a historical context as well as in the type of literature that it comes from. In the Old Testament, we have lots of different kinds of books. We have the Psalms, we have poetic literature, we also have law or legal literature, and we have the prophets. There's both major and minor prophets within the Old Testament. Now, minor does not mean that they played a lesser role. It simply means that the books are shorter. And the major prophets, like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, are much bigger books. And we do get a much bigger glimpse of the story that they hold, of what was happening in the Israelite nation at the time. But the minor prophets are kind of snapshots of pictures at a glimpse of time of what was happening in this place and at that time. So he was a minor prophet, that's how we refer to them, but he had a major prophecy. But he's unique in this list because his prophetic word was for a different group of people. God came to him and spoke to him and said, I want you to share with um, the Ninevites. Now, prophets in and of themselves, that word literally means, if you were to translate the Hebrew word to English, it simply means God's mouthpiece. So they were given a word from God, a prophecy, 
um, generally about something that needed to happen in the future. It could be both bad or good or was going to happen in the future, and they would prophesy about that. But they were God's mouthpiece on earth. And so when God came to Jonah and called him to be a prophet, and we don't know all of the stories that took place. We do know that he is referenced in Kings as being one of the prophets. Uh, but he is given this word for a group of people that is not part of the Israelite nation. In fact, they were far from it. They were enemies of God's chosen people. And he was called to go and speak to them, to the Ninevites. Now, some of you may have kids or grandkids, or you may just love Veggie Tales themselves. If you want the whole story, you can watch the Veggie Tale movie, and it's um, actually pretty good and funny. And Or you can stay for the next uh, 30 minutes or so, and I'll give you the whole story too. But I do encourage you to, to um, consider some of the things that happen here. So the background and a little bit of the history to this is the Ninevites people were in the city of Nineveh. And as I did research to get a better understanding of what this city was like, it's in current-day Mosul, Iraq, the second largest city in Iraq. And in the heart of Mosul is the area of the ancient city of Nineveh. Now, many of you will have heard or understood things like the uh, one of the ancient wonders of the world being the gardens, the hanging gardens of Babylon. Um, many new scholars um, are saying that there's actually no evidence for them being in Babylon, but they were probably in the city of Nineveh because the history as well as the other literature that talked about the amazing hanging gardens of the Assyrian people and the place that it played in history fits well with both what they find in the architecture of Nineveh as well as in the extra writings that happened at the time. So Nineveh was a city that had a great that was of great importance. At the time that Jonah lived, this was not the capital of Assyria, but it was a place where the king would have spent a lot of time, and later it became the capital of the Assyrian nation a little bit later. Now we need to understand that the Assyrians were a people who were very, very different than the Hebrew people. Um, there are many different uh, stories that we can read about them and the way that they treated. They were the largest army at the time, and they took authority of most of the known world in their about 300-year history. And they did this through military means, and they did it very different than some of the other people did. And they did it through gruesome, gruesome attacks, um, as well as making making their way into other people groups by killing and murdering and by fear mongering. And so you can read and hear about some of the things that they did at, through uh, inscriptions on stones, through depictions and stories that were passed down from this time. And so every horrific thing that you can think of, um, they would have done from peeling people's skin off while they're alive to piles of heads to warn people off to every kind of horrific, absolutely horrific thing. Um, that, that happened was attributed to the Assyrian people. And so when they would go into a nation to take over that nation, they didn't just take people into captivity, um, which they did in some ways with a few select people. They would come in and they would completely obliterate a people group. So cultural genocide in some way in often is the way that they went about things in the most horrific way that you can imagine. And they were coming and spreading east during the time of Jonah, spread, or spreading west, sorry, um, coming from the east to where the Hebrew people were. They had not yet taken um, Israel, but they were coming close. If you look at the other prophetic works, what was happening in the Holy Land at this time was just a few generations earlier, we had the kings of great prominence, David and then Solomon. And they ruled over the whole nation of Israel. After Solomon's reign, the kingdom split into north and south for Israel and Judah. And they had separate kings that oversaw the ten tribes of the north and the two tribes of the south. It's in the, in the north, in the country of Israel, where Jonah was called to be a prophet. And it was the first part of Israel. Israel was the first part of the Holy Land to be taken captive. It's known that in this time, the kings in the northern part of Israel were the worst of the worst, that they didn't follow God, they didn't obey him, and many of the other prophets spoke to a coming judgment, a people that would come to help, uh, that God would bring in to judge the people of Israel for their disobedience. 
Now, when Jonah gets his vision, there are two things happening. He sees the way that Israel is living around him, and he also, on their mind, would be the coming Assyrian army that would be slowly marching over the... It's still a, a number of years later, but it was there, always in the back of their mind, that there was this horrific military might that was slowly making its way west towards them. And this is where Jonah is called to speak to. I want to read, and we're going to read through quite a bit of the book of Jonah this morning. It's only four chapters long, uh, and we're going to talk about his story together. And so just the first two verses in that setting, we need to understand that this is where he comes to. Jonah 1, verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to this great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Go to the city of Nineveh. This is very unusual for one of the prophets to be called to a foreign nation. Jonah would have been quite content in many ways where he was. And the idea of going to this faraway land where people were killing in horrific ways his people and others like him is, would be a very, very difficult call. But clearly it says the word of the Lord came to him and said, go to this great city and preach against it. And Jonah's response comes in the next verse. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, said, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. But Jonah ran away. And in fact, he ran away as far as he could possibly go. So if you're looking at a map on the far east, you had the city of Nineveh. It would have been about 500 miles to the Holy Land, to where Jonah was, and he decided he was going to go about 1,000 miles further west, uh, probably to the southern tip of Spain is where Tarshish was, and he boarded a ship to go as far away as he possibly could from God. At this time, in this way, and in this culture, gods were often looked at as being territorial. And so you would worship a different god based on the place that you were, and they were seen or believed to be part of that area and that place. Throughout Scripture, we see how God displayed his might and power throughout the whole world, both through the creation of it and the accounts that we have of God interacting. But Jonah left, hoping to flee from him, to get far away from him. And in his mind, he thought, maybe if I got far enough away, God would leave me alone. So a couple things to notice. One, he knew that he was called to go, and he didn't want to do it. Right? And so he left and fled as far away as he could possibly think of. If you read through the next few verses, you'll hear the story of him boarding this boat and then being out in the middle of the sea, and a big storm comes, and the storm is coming and ravaging the boat. Now, he, as a prophet, wouldn't necessarily have been a great um, sailor, especially on an ocean-type vessel, but he was there. It actually says that he was sleeping in the hold of the boat as the storm came upon and the other sailors came to wake him, and they were trying to figure out why the gods were against them. And so as the boat rocked back and forth in the waves and the water splashed up over top and they were afraid that they would all die as this boat would go under, they began to ask, you know, what have you done to anger your gods? And they ended up drawing, deciding to draw straws and whoever would have drew the short straw is the one who God, his God was angry with him. And it happened to be Jonah, which was true and accurate, that there was something happening there. And so when they asked him, he responded, uh, they asked him who his God was, and he said, well, my God is the Lord of the heavens and the earth, of everything that we have and we see. And they asked what he had done, and he knew exactly what he had done. He had disobeyed. And so he said, you need to throw me over to save yourself. 
the sailors refused. They tried everything else, it says. They began throwing all their other stuff overboard. And finally, they decided that nothing was going to stop. And so they ended up throwing Jonah over the side of the ship. And then it goes on to say that the winds calmed and the seas died down. And I want to look at a specific verse with you in verse 16 of chapter 1. It says, at this, so right after they threw him overboard, at this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. After they had tried to do everything on their own, and finally gave up and said it's in God's hands and put him, Jonah, overboard. Everything calmed down and they realized the power of the God that Jonah worshipped. And so they feared him and they offered a sacrifice to him and they made vows to him. Jonah had run far away from God, but God had a bigger plan for him. I think, when I think of this story and I think of what happened as Jonah fled, many of us skip over this minor line, this single verse in this book that says that God was at work, even in the lives of those people in the ship that he was taking far away from him. And we don't know the story of what happened or where they went, but for a people who saw the power of God and then they feared him, made an offering to him, and then made vows to him, you can only imagine the impact it had on them when they finally pulled into a port to restock their ship that they had just completely thrown overboard. I think the power of God is an amazing, amazing thing. And Jonah, I think, knew it but he also didn't like it. Didn't like what God asked him to do, and so he read, and I'm sure at this point that he thought that it was all over. I'm sure at this point he said, well, it's because of me, so if I die, if you throw me over and I drown, then it will all be better for you, and I won't have to follow through with what God called me to do. goes on to say that a large... Fish, a great fish swallowed Jonah, and he was inside the fish for three days and three nights. And then inside that fish, fish much of chapter 2, is a prayer that Jonah prayed to God in heaven. I want to read this for you as well this morning. But I want to point out that this prayer took place within the belly of this great fish, whatever that looked like. But I want you to notice that this is a prayer of thanksgiving, is how it's classified. And so when we read these words and when you think about it, it's a prayer where Jonah is thankful for what happened while he was inside the belly of this fish. So chapter 2 says, "From From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to you, the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down, from the earth beneath barred me, The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord, my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. A prayer of thanksgiving. From inside the belly of a fish, 
a recognition of the power of God and of what he had done and was doing. And then the very last line of the prayer, a recognition of the power of God, that salvation comes from the Lord. After he was vomited out, as it reads, onto dry land, it goes on to say that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. The exact same command, isn't it? Go to the city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And it goes this time, the next verse says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. We need to understand how difficult this would have been for Jonah. He ran far away. He knew that they were a horrific people. And we can give you all kinds of descriptions about what that would be or what that would look like and the fear that would be in his heart or his mind. Uh, but there are many different current day analogies that fit to help us understand. Some of you would remember the height of what it was like to live during World War II as Hitler's armies began to take over the world. Some have described what Jonah experienced as a Jew being sent to the heart of Berlin in 1943 in order to stand before Hitler and proclaim that they need to repent, to literally turn away from what they are doing. Others may describe it as about a, a decade ago as a Tutsi would head to the Hutu territory in Rwanda where a people group was trying to completely annihilate them and stand there with full confidence saying that you need to stop what you're doing, turn from your ways, and seek God's salvation. Or maybe even a little closer to home would be that one of you, or maybe me, would be called to tomorrow to leave from here and head to the heart of Syria to stand before the leadership of ISIS, of the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, and proclaim to them that what they're doing has reached the ears of God and they need to stop, turn from their ways and find his salvation. So how many of you, if God came to you and said, I want you to go to Syria, track down the ISIS leaders and stand before them and tell them that they're being judged by God would run the other way? It seems like the right easy answer, doesn't it? And in essence, that's what Jonah was called to do. The Ninevites did horrific things, so does ISIS, this radical, radical Islamic state group. But the second time, he decided to go. There was a whole lot that happened from a storm to a fish to being spit out on a beach. He, I think he knew he wasn't going to get away from it. But I don't think he was happy to go either. I want to read a few more verses in chapter 3. So it says, Jonah obeyed, this is verse 3 of chapter 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day Jonah started into the city, he proclaimed, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. 
This is what the decree said. Do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let a man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God and let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. So Jonah followed through. He went to Nineveh. And he said, simply, it's just recorded, and this is the shortest prophecy of a prophet in any of the books. Because this is the only time where Jonah says what God told him to say. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. That's all that is recorded in here. And it says that all of the people from the greatest to the least did that. They began to mourn. They began to fast. They began to sit in the dirt. They began to cry out to God, to the God that Jonah brought from 500 miles west of them, and pray that they would be brought before a compassionate God. So if it was you... And you had the courage to head to Iraq, to Syria, and make that proclamation, repent. And everyone did. Right before your eyes. What would you do? Would there be excitement, cheering, praise? Absolutely, right? Now, if your family or my family had been personally impacted by someone from ISIS, it changes a little bit of how we think from an earthly way. If we had walked through the streets where we saw bodies dismembered and our families killed and all of a sudden God began to show these people mercy and compassion I think we get a little bit of a bigger picture of what Jonah does because he responds in chapter 4 verse 1 so right after they cried out to God all of the people It says, but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. I think greatly displeased is an understatement. He was furious. And he prayed to the Lord, it says in verse 2, Oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. The people repented. They turned from their ways, and God showed compassion on them. And the prophet who came with the message calling them to turn from their ways said, God, I knew this is what you were going to do. But I didn't want it to happen. He says, this is the reason that I fled. Tried to get as far away from them and from you as I could because I want them to suffer. He says, I knew you were a compassionate God but I didn't want your compassion to be poured out on those people. Interesting book, isn't it? 
It's not often that we see this within the prophets of the Old Testament where we see their frustration with the God who called them. Because when God calls us, he doesn't always call us to easy work. And it doesn't mean that we'll like it or that we'll understand it. And Jonah's a great example of that. That he was God's mouthpiece on earth. That God would speak to him a word for the people. God had chosen him. But there's a human side to Jonah. And he did not like the Ninevites. He wanted them to suffer. He wanted them to pay for what they had done. Now I shared with you in the announcement time of the couple coming of John and Eloise Bergen. I think if that was me and Jamie that were attacked and left for dead, I honestly don't know how outside of God's great grace and compassion for us that I would be able to stand beside the people who attacked us. This is a little bit, and and I know you know what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, because I think it's part of our human nature that when we've been wronged, and when we've been wronged in such a horrific way, whether us as individuals or people that we love and care for, that we desire retribution, our earthly version of justice. That we can become angry and we can look for something, some way to set it right in our eyes. That's what Jonah wanted. I'm not going there because if I go there and they listen to your word, they will return, they will turn and repent. And God, you are a compassionate God and I know you will hear. But I just want them to suffer. It's the story of Jonah. We don't always get all of this in the Bible's, the kids' Sunday school lesson, do we? There's usually big colorful pictures of a boat and a fish and then a beach and then everybody praising. Some of them have the next part of the story, a story of a tree of a plant of some kind. I want to read for you, um, on the back of your blue sheet, I put quotes, uh, different things that spoke to me, but this very bottom one I wanted to read to help understand. It's a quote from a pastor named Mark Buchanan, a Canadian pastor who uh, now teaches in in Alberta at a Bible college, but now... uh, was pastoring for many years, and he wrote this. He said, Jonah was a God evader, a coward and a bully with a wide streak of vindictiveness. He cringed at mercy, bristled with anger, relished retribution. His emotions worked in a narrow range, boasting, blaming, gloating, sulking, avenging. Let me say by way of confession that I feel a kinship with him. I think many of us would, wouldn't we? We would feel that same kinship with Jonah. It's so easy being on the other side of the world and not being in the heart of the problem of ISIS. That we can say it would be great and we would praise God. And I think ultimately we would. But I understand where Jonah's coming from. And I believe that many of you do as well. Let's read from verse 3 down. Verse 3 of chapter 4, it says, Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry. 
Jonah went, went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the vine so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and as many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Jonah, after they turned their hearts to God, in his anger went up on a hill and sat there to watch what would happen. He still missed it, didn't he? He missed what God was doing and what God's heart really was. So God used a little bit of an object lesson some kind of strange plant sprung up and provided him shade from the sweltering heat. Remember, this is in the middle of Iraq, in a desert. And he was grateful for it. And then the very next day, God took it away. And he was angry about it. And God said, you've missed it. There are bigger things at work here. There's a whole city filled with people who I love, people who I created, who don't know their right hand from their left. They are completely lost. But we know that God created them just like he created Jonah. But Jonah didn't want to know that. This is where the book of Jonah ends. I can tell you that throughout the history, there is some mention in extra biblical literature of the time that talks of a time of peace in Nineveh. Now, many scholars who don't believe that the Bible is true and accurate, they would say that there's really no recognition of a repentance of Nineveh, except there's this strange time that we can't explain, of a time where the city was peaceful. Now, remember, Nineveh was one city in a larger culture of Assyria at the time. It wasn't the capital, but it was a place where they did have a ruler within this larger culture. About a hundred years after Jonah's proclamation is when Assyria took over and spread and eventually took the northern kingdom of Israel. And this repentance looks like it lasted for about a generation in this one city and didn't impact the larger culture of Assyria. But there are some important things that we need to learn from this. One, that we don't know what happened to Jonah, but that God used him then to impact 120,000 people because God loved them. It says at the very beginning that he, their cries came to his ears. He heard them, what was going on. And he wanted to intervene and act, and God chose Jonah. We also see, and it's in the study notes, that there are three different places in the New Testament where this story is referenced, one by Jesus himself. But there's an important role and place to the story of Jonah within our understanding of what God calls us to do. And so if we were that Jew sent to Berlin, if we were that Jonah sent to Nineveh, if we are that Christian sent to Isis, we need to recognize that there is a bigger picture at play. That God is doing something different. 
Does that mean that it would be easy? Absolutely not, and probably far from it. And I assume that many of us would struggle if God called us to take such a step. Just being honest, right? It would be a hard, hard step to take. Now, as we apply this a little bit to you and to me today, there's a few things that we get the benefit of history looking back on. We get to see that God loved them, that God called people to go reach them like Jonah, that God had a plan in place. And so we look back and see the good things that are there. We also get the benefit of what we else we find in Scripture and of church history over the last 2,000 years. And so there's two things that I think we need to recognize from this passage of Scripture. And the first is that sometimes we are called to go. After Jesus' death and resurrection, and just a couple weeks ago we celebrated a day that we call in the church Pentecost, a day where the Holy Spirit came down and fell upon his people, those who declared Jesus as Lord. If we read through the New Testament carefully, especially the letters that were written to various churches, we get to see how we, as followers of Christ, all of us, have a role to play in God's kingdom. That there are specific roles and abilities, whether that's a teacher, a pastor, gifts of mercy, gifts of help, gifts of prophecy, and other things that are listed in the New Testament. But yet at the same time, each and every one of us are ambassadors. Each and every one of us are priests. Each and every one of us have the Spirit of God dwelling within us. And each and every one of us are called to witness to what God has done in us. We are all disciples, followers, students, children of God. And just like Jonah was called to go to Nineveh, each and every one of us are called to go. Unfortunately, you're going to have to define where that is on your own. If you don't know what you're called to do, I invite you to be like the people of Nineveh. Put on sackcloth and ashes, sit down in the dust and cry out to God. Or you could do it in your devotional time. But if you really want to know what God wants you to do, spend time in his word. Spend time with his body, his church, and come before him in prayer. Because each and every one of us, no matter how young, no matter how old, no matter how new in the faith, no matter how many years, we have been called to do something. Each and every one of us, without exception. Most of us will not be called to the heart of ISIS in Syria. But I believe that some will. Right? Right? We do have missionaries right now, not only from our denomination, but from many others that are giving up the hope of a future to go live and serve undercover in a country where they could lose their life if their faith is found out. Now, that's not each and every one of us. But I hope that gives you a little bit more courage when God tells you that maybe you need to pull over help that person on the side of the road. Maybe you need to visit with your coworker after work, head, to, head for coffee with them because of something that's going on in their life. Maybe there's a family member that you need to call who you haven't talked to in a long time. Maybe there's something you need to give up. Maybe there's something you need to give away. Maybe there's some place that you need to go. We are all called to go as a church and as a people. And if we don't listen, we can grow cold in our obedience. 
just like Jonah did. He ran as far away as he could. Now he ran away because of the second thing, that he didn't care about them. I think we're not only called to go, but we are called to care. God, it says in Scripture, sent his son to die for just Ron and Randy and me. No, he didn't, did he? He sent his son to die for the entire world, for all people. Whether we like them or not, God still died for them. And one of the things is we get close with God, and I know that many of you will attest to this, that the longer you spend with God in his word, in his worship, worship of him, and in your prayer life, it changes the way that you see people. You begin to see and experience the love that he has for others through your interactions with them. I think we are called to care. I want to read for you the verse that I put there. It's from 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. It says, This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So God loved us. Therefore, verse 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The act of witnessing, of sharing, is simply sharing what God has done in our life. Not only his love that he had for us, but that changes us and helps us to experience love for others the way that God has a love for them. And if we don't experience this ability to care and love for one another, then just like Jonah, we as a church and we as a people can grow cold in our compassion. And I would say today, in our culture and in our world, I think the area of Islam is probably the biggest area or one of the big areas where we can see what's happening around the globe on the other side of the world and hear the horrific stories of what's happening. And we can very, very quickly become like a Jonah and sit quietly on our hands with our mouths shut, just waiting for God's vengeance to pour down on them. That's not what God does. God is a God who loves and cares, who definitely has his own system of justice, but that system is so far removed and so different from our view of what should happen often. I think for you and me, and this is my call to you, is to think of the people that you meet. Maybe you will see them at work. Maybe they will be sitting beside you at Tim Hortons when you stop for coffee. Maybe they live right across the fence from you. And the call is to begin to try to see people with the same eyes as God. Because when we do, our hearts begin to change, our lives begin to change, and we become more like God. It's an act of discipleship. It's an act of growing in obedience. And our act of going, what God may call us to do, may be simple, but it can make the world of difference. So 
as we go today, I want you to think about that. Both what may God be calling you to do, to go to, and how may he be calling you to change, to change what you see with your eyes. I want to take a moment and pray for you, and then we'll close the service after that. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your love. God, we recognize that you loved us so much, you have sought after us from the moment that we rebelled in the garden right until today, and that you have been working at restoring the relationship that you have with your creation. And through your Son, Jesus Christ, you opened up a way so that we may have access to you and once again walk alongside of you. God, we are so grateful for that love, for that sacrifice, and for the opportunity we have to choose to follow you. And God, as we go here from today, I just ask that each of us would feel your presence that we would see clearly where we are being called to go and that you may open our eyes to see people around us as if we were seeing them with your eyes and with your love. You call us to love one another. And God, I ask that you would help us to accomplish that, that your spirit would empower and direct and guide and strengthen us. God, go with us today as we leave here and be with us in the week ahead as we strive to go and to love and to care. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Next weekend, I really encourage you to come and to hear the story of John and Eloise Bergen because for me, when I think about the story of Jonah, when I think about the things that would have been going through his head, I can picture people in my life who I have struggled to forgive, who I have had to come before God and say, God, I need the strength. And I'm sure that you have the same people in your life. So what John and Eloise do is they have been called to a ministry of helping people find forgiveness and reconciliation. And they're going to share how they did that and how God has led them to do this over the past decade as they have traveled to churches over and over again. I know of people personally, friends of mine, who out of the blue this couple has called them and said, I think God wants us to come to your church. Do you have an issue with forgiveness? And they did. And they came and great things happened. I think it's God's timing, and I'd encourage you, and it's open for anyone to come, not just for our church, but it's uh, the invitation is wide open for any friends, family, community members, strangers to come and hear their story. On the Sunday next week, we're going to have a lunch following the service, and that lunch is going to be a special meal that I invite you all to stay for. And I'm just mentioning it today because it's going to also be a fundraiser meal. Um, a few months ago, we talked and we're looking for people to head to Cuba. There's 10 from our Saskatchewan churches that are going to Cuba in July. Um, and the money from this lunch will help with something in particular on that trip. And so the lunch is being paid for completely. All of the money that I, I um, welcome you to, to bring in to donate will go directly towards this trip to Cuba. Uh, all of the trips are paid for. I, I am going from here. Um, I've been invited and asked to do some teaching with the young adults um, on leadership and on relationships in, in Cuba while, I'm, while we're there. Um, but we want to take for them uh, study pens, special pens. Pens and pencils are really hard for them to get. And they asked if we could bring highlighters or something for their Bibles so that they, as they study, they could write in them. Uh, we decided against highlighters because they often soak through Bible pages unless you get the really expensive good ones. Um, but we want to purchase for these 300 young adults who want to become leaders in their church um, the four-color pens 
so that we can take them down and use them. And that's what this money will go towards. All of the individual money to pay for the trip, my trip is paid for. Um, all of the other nine members, they're covered. And so this will go towards that. And if there's extra money, we'll also go towards um, pencil crayons for the children that are there. So we encourage you to come and to think of that next Sunday following the service. So as we finish today, make sure to look ahead at your calendar and see what God may be asking you to come to and also what he may ask you to go and do. So may God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you in this week ahead. And may you go experiencing his